Ken, you wrote a book called Why Greatness Cannot Be Planned, The Myth of the Objective. So I love the idea of this book. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but my understanding is that even in the title there, you're making a connection between the kind of planning for greatness that humans like to do and tying that to the objective function that we use in almost all machine learning algorithms in order for that machine learning algorithm to be optimized. Is that correct? Is that the kind of connection that you're making in this book? That is correct. Um, and there's actually a pretty long story there, which I'll try not to make long. Um, but it, you know, it goes back to the, to the fact that I was, previous to writing this book, really just an AI researcher. I mean, that's basically all I was doing is AI research. And so I was using objective functions and things like that. And we discovered through experiments that we did some really interesting facets of objective functions that are very counterintuitive, which included the insight that sometimes you cannot do very well at getting to the objective function to be maximized by actually trying to get it to maximize. That actually, oh. in other words, another way of saying it is that maybe a better way to get to, say, um, some algorithm performing the way you want it to perform might be actually not trying to uh, maximize the objective or optimize the objective. And so that was very counterintuitive. Um, we saw this through several experiments, including at first experiments that were involving humans in the loop, which was one was called pick breeder. And that observation originally was just an observation about AI and machine learning. And it was, but it was really, to me, profound. I thought, wow, like that's just totally counterintuitive and, and probably really important to know. Um, and I spoke about it a lot at AI conferences um, actually, we created a whole new algorithm called Novelty Search because of it. And but like in the course of doing that over like a few years, I started to appreciate that like it's not just about AI and machine learning. You know, because conversations would veer off, questions at the ends of talks would veer off to like, well, but what does that mean? You know, for my life or what I do? Like, <laughs> I also have objectives, and like, does this apply more broadly or just like? Bigger questions like how does how does society work because society is very objectively oriented or institutions which like decide what to do based on whether an objective is actually being maximized or or whether it's being satisfied and it it started to dawn on me that this is like a really big broad topic and it also affects people personally you know because one of the biggest most impactful interactions I had early on before the book was with a, a bunch of artists because um, I was speaking at the Rhode Island School of Design. And hmm. it, it had it sort of like brought into focus for me that um, like this was an emotional, like personal psychological issue, not just an issue about like practical, how do I get things done? But they were, you know, th th there was a very kind of cathartic reaction when I sort of described some of these things that I had observed in algorithms because they were saying, oh, this finally justifies in some way something that I haven't been able to justify, which is like, why am I doing what I'm doing? And this is, you could see like, this would be more of a problem for like artists and like software engineers or something because their parents are like, what is this for? Like, where are you going with this? Or like, what is the point of this? And it's like, well, there are some things where you can't, you don't have to define an objective and actually you might get to a better place if you don't. Um, and that like really kind of validated, I think in a way, some of the life choices that people were making. So all of this combined like in my mind to think, like, man, there's like a much bigger implication. And I thought this was super exciting. Like, I was like, when has ever there been like an algorithmic insight that leads to like social critique or like to understanding yourself better? And then I thought, well, but it should be that way. I mean, this is artificial intelligence. You'd think like if we make any advances or have any deep insights in AI, that should actually lead us to understanding ourselves better, shouldn't it? Um, right. And so in some way you would expect that that is sort of an implication that will naturally emerge from as the more we learn about AI, the more we learn about ourselves. And so I just thought at some point, like uh, this, this has to be a book because like you can't really talk about the social implications, like the larger implications for personal objectives, for institutional objectives by writing an AI paper because that just goes to the AI community. So the only thing I could think of doing was writing a book, um, which would be trying to kind of trigger a, a broader social conversation like across society about how we run things. Because I think the yeah. insights here suggest that we don't run things very smartly, especially when we're aiming for innovation or discovery. Wow. Okay. So this ties to an idea that I've had recurringly while I'm on runs or in the shower or that kind of thing. I had been thinking about this talk in my head where I wanted to relate maximizing a reward function, a kind of objective function, uh, common in deep reinforcement learning. So with deep reinforcement learning algorithms, 
we have an algorithm that can typically explore an environment, and then you have some uh, some objective, uh, typically defined as a reward. So as a simple example, if you're training a an algorithm to play a video game, you're training it to play Tetris, say, you want it to maximize its score in Tetris. So uh, that's your reward. And so you're trying to, you're, you allow your deep reinforcement learning algorithm typically to explore uh, various kinds of actions that it could take and try to uh, learn what the actions are that will lead to maximizing that score in Tetris, that to maximizing that reward. And so a few years ago, as, as I was learning a lot about deep, re deep reinforcement learning, I, it kept occurring to me that I was, I was making this parallel to my own life. I was thinking about what is the reward function that I am optimizing for. Like if I could ref define it down to one thing. And so, you know, it would be something like contentment or if you can define what happiness is, uh, you know, there's, and then, so I had been, I'd been, I've been in my head for years kicking around the thought of this idea of doing a presentation similar to what you're describing, a talk that is not necessarily designed for a data science audience or an AI audience, but maybe for a, a general lay audience and kind of explaining at a high level, this idea of reward functions and then saying, uh, you know, so we're kind of like this as well. We're trying to like, you know, whether we're aware of it or not, we are probably spending some of our, or a lot of our time objective, like trying to take actions to maximize some abstract reward, um, that, that, may, that we may have in our subconscious. Um, and so I haven't actually created that presentation. It sounds like from <laughs> what we're hearing from you today, that maybe I should be rethinking doing it at all. If it sounds like that, you know, this idea of maximizing a reward function might not get me where I want to anyway. So in terms of like your social, we'll get back to the machine learning stuff in a second, but, and, and maybe you'll, you'll end up even referring to machine learning in your answer, but in terms of what I as a person should be doing to to achieve my goals, what should I be doing instead of trying to climb some reward function? Right. And this, this gets to some, some subtle points. So, because usually like the first knee jerk reaction, if you hear like this, the general point that, oh, objectives actually can be self-defeating or actually I like to call it the objective paradox. It's like setting an objective actually causes you not to achieve the objective. Then the kind of knee jerk reaction is like, well, what are you suggesting? We just like go around randomly or something like the, Like we need, we need some kind of guidance. Like you can't just be random, but I think it's important to um, elaborate that like that clearly uh, like the, the lesson is not that you should just be random. Like that's not the point. And I think especially for machine learning researchers or reinforcement learning researchers, like the mind tends to go in that direction because often when the word exploration really is associated with just taking a random step. You know, we tend to think of this exploitation versus exploration dichotomy in machine learning. And we think, oh, well, you know, it's sort of like the exploitation is the principal thing. Like, it's like you're following the gradient. The exploration is just like do whatever and just hope for something good to happen. That isn't a good dichotomy. And actually, that's why I don't really like to um, analogize this insight with exploration versus exploitation, because it's what I think it's doing is really underselling exploration. Like the real insight here is that exploration is a very principled and rich thing that we do as humans intuitively and instinctively, which is not just taking random actions. And what we do do is we tend to follow and you, you tried to kind of like distill it down into like a word or something like happiness or contentment. The word that I often use is interestingness. Like we tend mm. to follow a path that we find interesting. And you have to understand that like that word interesting is really just um, kind of um, distilling it like a huge array of like amazingly intelligent capacities that we have, which, which currently like would be like AI complete in some way. Um, to be able to actually formalize what interestingness is. And by the way, it's different for every individual human. Um, but we have a very good instinct for interestingness. It's very, it's kind of domain dependent. Like if you've spent your life thinking about gardening, like you'll be very good at understanding what might be interesting in that space compared to someone who has not done that. Um, and so, but within the spaces where you're kind of familiar, the domains where you're familiar, you have a very good nose for the interesting. And that's the thing that I think we tend to discount like way too much. It's like you kind of say, but it's not principled because like the thing about it is you can't measure it. Like that's what makes people feel uncomfortable. And that's why we like objectives so much is that they're measurable. We can mm -hmm. measure like progress towards an objective. We call that assessment. Um, and so we love assessment. That's a very like 
popular idea in our culture. And I think it's like a basically a security blanket because we're very insecure about the possibility that something bad might happen. And so we want to like do everything we can to guard against that possibility. But if you think about it, if you're worried, if you're trying to do something that's exploratory, so it's not, um, it's like, it's like there are things where objectives do make sense. I want to make that caveat clear. Like I, I agree that in certain situations, and I usually characterize them where you have basically modest goals that are very realistic, like then, yeah, it makes sense to measure progress along an objective and you should. So the kind of argument I'm making really applies to situations where you're going somewhere and you really don't know how to get there. Um, right. So I call it more like ambitious situations or like situations right. where you're trying to innovate or be creative. Now, those situations, the objective can be very bad for you um, because it basically stops you from seeing all the other options that you have. And the problem is the deceptive, the, the, the objective itself is deceptive. So like the compass that you're using, which is measuring progress towards the objective, is actually misleading you rather than leading you in the right direction. Um, right. And this happens all the time. Of course, deception is just pervasive in, in like all complex problems and you, have, you think about it, like the reason they're called complex is because they are deceptive. In other words, it may right. look like as you measure progress, things are going up, but actually you're going towards a dead end. Like there's some extreme examples you could think of, like, for example, like if I was trying to get to the moon, but I tried to begin by climbing a mountain, then, you know, your objective function will go up for a while. In fact, when you get to right. the top of the mountain, you have reason to celebrate, like you've, you've achieved something, something right. substantial, but it has nothing to do with getting to the moon. Um, right. And this is a really like cautionary tale because a lot of the things we're doing, uh, like in in like some of the most complex problems that we have, are exactly like that. They're highly deceptive. Right. We see progress and even rapid progress, and we celebrate and think we're going to go all the way, but actually we're just on a deceptive local optimum, and that's obviously a problem. So objectives can be like very misleading in that way when we don't know what the stepping stones are that will lead us from where we where we are to where we want to be. So right. the alternative is. Let's go to places that we find interesting. Now, that's different than random, right? Because interesting is based on information, tons of information, your entire life, basically, plus everything that biology has endowed you with um, over, the, over the eons of evolution. All go into what you find interesting today, right now, in this second. So it's not by any means random, and it's highly rich information, and people tend to be very good at it. But the problem is, and this is the thing you have to understand, which is, which is subtle and kind of um, counterintuitive about this, the problem is that... If you follow gradients of interestingness, you don't know where you're going. You have to accept that. So there's no guarantee that you will, because of following what you find is interesting, go to something that you a priori thought was your objective. Of course, it won't guarantee something like that. What it does do, though, is it increases the probability that you'll actually encounter something that's good. It may just not be the objective that you had. So like, what you have to, to sort of make a shift is... If I want to achieve something great, following interestingness can be a very good formula, but I can't guarantee and I can't make it very likely that I'll achieve a particular great thing. And there's nothing we can do about that, which is, I think, really interesting. Like, There's no formula that exists on this planet or in anybody's mind that will make it very, very likely that you will achieve something that no one has any clue how we're going to ever accomplish. There is just no formula for that. What I'm proposing is a formula for making it more probable that we will over time uncover many of these things that we find interesting, but without knowing which one will happen or in what order.